We're going to get into the Word. We're going to talk about this is that. This is the fourth message in our series on the Holy Spirit. And today we're going to look at part two of the purpose of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Father, thank you for your love and grace today. Thank you for this time together as a family. And I pray, Holy Spirit, today that you will open our hearts and our minds to hear and understand and receive your word. Bring illumination like turning a light on as we hear the word today, Father. And we thank you for it and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Today's message is a continuation of last week on the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Now, week after next, we're going to shift into the power of the Holy Spirit. So on the day of Pentecost, which is one of the main Jewish feasts, one of their three main annual feasts, there was a gathering together there in Jerusalem, and it was 40 days after Jesus had ascended back into heaven. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says in Acts 2, fell on a group of about 120 people that were Jesus' followers. The disciples were there. Mary was there, his mother. And they, they experienced something uh, quite unusual. The Bible says in Acts 2, 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, other languages, uh, beyond what their normal language was, as the Spirit gave them the ability or the or utterance to do that. Now, the people in the crowd we learned last week had two responses. Uh, one group says they're drunk. Uh, another group says, "What is this? This is real." Because we hear them speaking our language, articulate uh, uh, language, and drunk people don't usually act that way. I don't, I don't know if you had that experience or not, but. But drunk people don't usually speak in languages that they've never heard before in a very clear, concise way. And so the two responses were there that day. And Peter stood up, anointed and inspired by the Holy Spirit, and began to answer and explain. And this is what happened in chapter, chapter 2, verse 15. For these are not drunk as you suppose, seeing it's but the third hour of the day, which was 9 a.m. But this is that. Everybody say, this is that. Now, he begins, he said, what you're seeing, this is that which the prophet began to speak, prophet Joel prophesied about. So he goes back to the Old Testament. He connects with the prophet Joel, and he says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. So many people today have a similar response to the Holy Spirit. What does this mean? Others are, I don't care what it means. And even others are contradictory to what's going on. Now, we looked last week at what Jesus told his disciples. Now, here's what Jesus told the disciples about the Holy Spirit in John 15, 26. He says, but when the Helper comes. Everybody say Helper. Anybody ever need a Helper? Anybody? Just a few of you? Anybody ever need help in doing anything? Okay. Anybody ever need help in trying to figure out how to open up your computer? Ask your five-year-old grandchild. They can get that done. John 16, 7, Jesus said to his disciples and to us today, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. In other words, Jesus said, I'm not telling you a lie. I'm telling you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. Now, remember, that's the scripture where it's like, Really, Jesus? How is it advantageous to us for you to leave? But here's what he says. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So what Jesus is saying is, if I don't go... The Father's not going to send the Helper. But if I do go, He's going to send the Helper. And that's what happened in the first part of the book of Acts. Now, now, as we mentioned previously, the Greek word translated Helper here is paraclete. It means one called alongside to help. So the Holy Spirit is not our butler. The Holy Spirit is not our maid. The Holy Spirit is not someone that, that is just there to work for us to do what we want them, Him to do. The Holy Spirit is our Helper. So He helps us. As we do. If we don't do, there's nothing to help us do. And that that's really gets into a step of faith, how to walk in faith as well. But that's a whole other message series. So the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, is sent to help us. Last week we looked at two main things that he helps us to do. Number one is conviction. Everybody say conviction. conviction. And we learned that the, the real meaning of that means to convince that the Holy Spirit convinces us, of our, makes us aware of our need for God and his love for us. And then comfort, the Holy Spirit comforts us when nothing else can. Prayed with the family this morning in the first service that 
Only the Holy Spirit can comfort. There are people here right now. Only the Holy Spirit. No amount of me patting you on the back or me saying you're going to make it. It's going to matter a lot. It may help some, but not a But the Holy Spirit can comfort us when we're hurting, when we're broken, when we're confused, when all those things are going on in life. The Holy Spirit is there to help us and to comfort us. Now, let's take it one step further here. And this is a biggie that the Holy Spirit helps us with. He reveals God to us. John 14, 26 says this, But the Helper, now these are the words of Jesus, so I'm just quoting Jesus here. But the Helper, when the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance what the things that I have said to you. John 16, 15. The Spirit will take what is mine and make it known to you. Now, the most common way the Holy Spirit reveals God to us uh, is through the Word of God, the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, the truth of God's Word. See, God's Word is, is, is living. It's spirit and it's life, the Bible. That's why we need to read the Bible every day. It's faith food. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. In 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, we find this. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy, nothing from, nothing from the Bible... Our scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. So this, the Bible is not some guy making up stories. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, verse 21, but men spoke from God as they were carried along or inspired by the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All scripture is God-breathed or inspired by God. Now let me explain that God-breathed. It is life. The, 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 the word of God is life. When God created Adam in the garden and shaped him out of the clay of the ground, the Bible says he breathed life in him. It's the same context, the same wording that this is about the Scriptures, the Word of God. God breathed life. The, the, spirit, the Word of God is spirit, the Bible says, and life. So when we, when we look at the Word of God, when we read the Word of God, we, we, give, we give credence to it. We believe the Word of God. It becomes alive to us. Now, the Holy Spirit reveals things to us about the Word of God that we may not know to begin with. You know, somebody who is not saved, is not born again, is not a Christian, uh, just, just maybe they believe that there is a God, but they, they've never accepted Jesus as their Savior, they can't understand the Word of God. They can may, maybe, you know, I mean, it's part of it they might, but they can't have a revelation of the Word of God because they're not connected to the author of the Word of God. And people who are hostile towards the Word of God, of course, they take some scripture and make fun of it and build all kinds of nonsense out of it and make it say something it doesn't. They, they can't have a conceptualization of the Word of God or an understanding because they don't know the author. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, but people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them and they can't understand it for only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. That's why I don't debate people. I'm not a debater. I've got some pastor friends. They love to debate. They'll sit down with somebody and argue for, for four hours about something, some doctrine in the Bible. I've never done that. I'm not, I'm not a debater. I know what I know and I know that an experience always trumps an argument. So don't try to explain to me something that is not in the Word of God that I've already experienced and am experiencing on a daily basis in my life. Besides, I don't like to debate people who are wrong. I know I'm right. There's no point in me arguing with somebody that's wrong. You didn't get that, did you? Okay. All right. You know, I, I've realized that, that it's the Holy Spirit that brings truth to people. Arguments don't bring truth to people. Debates don't bring truth to people. And in order for us to have a revelation from the Word of God, something that's real, revealed to us, we have to be humble. We have to humble ourselves before God and His Word. We, we have to be honest with ourselves. You know, one of the reasons that, that, that people can't receive from God, from the Word of God, because there's so many barriers. False teaching could be a barrier. Uh, uh, a, a, uh, what we used to call in church a sacred cow could be a barrier. What's a sacred cow? It's something that's become sacred to you that's not sacred at all. One of the reasons many churches can't grow and develop and do things is because they've made systems to be sacred. And there's no sacred system. The only thing sacred we have here is the B-I-B-L-E, the Word of God. That's sacred. That's the Word of God. Everything else is up for grabs to change, to develop, to do what we need to do to reach people in our generation. 
So, so if we have something that we've made, well, this is what mama believed, and this is what grandma believed, and we believed this for 100 years or 400 years, and we believed this, and this is what we believe this way. Yeah, but, but is it true? You know, it gets to a point where it doesn't matter if it's true or not. We believe it, and that's what we do. We just believe it because we believe it. Why do you believe that? I don't know. That's one of the things when I started pastoring, I had to, ch- I had to challenge everything that I believed. And I found out some of the stuff I believed was unbelievable. I needed to quit believing that. Some of them, well, that's God, it's going to be like this. And, and, but I had to be honest, see. You've got to be honest with yourself and honest with God for God to open our hearts and speak life to us. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He reveals. Verse 16 tells us that we would have the mind of Christ. Does that mean we know everything God knows? No, 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 no. It means that we have the capacity to understand what God wants us to understand. The Holy Spirit transformed. There's two Greek words for the word words for word in the Bible. One is logos, and that is the written word of God. The other is rhema. That's the revealed word of God. The written Word of God, when we open it up, we start reading, that's the written Word of God. As we read it, the Holy Spirit can reveal that in our hearts it becomes the revealed Word of God to us. It's a different from head knowledge to heart knowledge. How many know you can have head knowledge but not heart knowledge and you don't get it? One day Jesus said to his disciples, he says, who do men say that I am? Well, they say you're this prophet and that prophet and this person. He said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up boldly as he did often many times. He said from the King James that I grew up with, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. What he would say, he said, Christ means Messiah. It's not Jesus' last name. So many people think Christ is Jesus Christ. It's his last name or middle name. No. Christ means the Messiah. So he says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. You know what Jesus said to him? He said, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. What do you mean, what do you mean flesh and blood? He's, he, what he was saying was people, human beings, did not reveal. Your Sunday school teacher didn't reveal that to you. Your pastor didn't reveal that to you. Your life group leader didn't reveal that to you. Your priest didn't reveal that to you. Your grandma didn't reveal that to you. Your doctor didn't reveal that to you. Then he said, but my Father in heaven revealed that to you. What is he talking about? That's revelation knowledge. That's a rhema word. I just want to take a quick poll here. How many times has anybody in this place today ever in your life, you're reading the Bible and all of a sudden something you read just became real to you? Just, it, just like it jumped off the page. Like it, like it, just wave at me if you've ever had that happen in your life. Look at there. Just about everybody in this place. More than, I can't tell you how many times this happened in my life. And many times in a very critical time where I needed a word from God along those lines and God revealed that to me. Now, a second thing that the Holy Spirit does, we'll talk about today, is He empowers us to pray. How many here would like to feel like your prayer life could improve just a tad? All of us, of course. Yeah. If there's one thing I've struggled with over four decades of ministry is, is developing a stronger, more intimate prayer life with Jesus. Well, the Holy Spirit's the answer. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself, that's the Holy Spirit, makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. One translation says groanings as uh, in, without articulate speech. Now he who searches the hearts knows that the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. In other words, the Holy Spirit knows what to pray and how to pray. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession. So, Ephesians 6.18 says, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert. Be persistent in your prayers for all believers elsewhere. Now, that term praying in the Spirit for churches that believe in the present, modern day, right now, uh, manifestation, realization of what is called in Acts the baptism of the Holy Spirit in John and, and what Jesus, that's what Jesus called it. He said, it's just as you were baptized by John, not many days from now you're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's where that term comes from. It's just Jesus talking. And that's what Jesus said. Now if we believe in that and believe in the present day manifestation of that, praying in the Spirit simply means praying in the heavenly prayer language or in what Acts called it, tongues or different languages. Now, 
We're going to deal with this more when we get to the power, but I just want to unpack it just for a moment right now. The devil is a master at bringing confusion with people. Now, not too many people are confused about spiritual things by watching CNN or any of the other fake news networks. But I tell you where people are confused about, about spiritual things, and that's within the church body. So where the devil targets the church body by helping to create doctrines that are, are incorrect, uh, bringing confusion that, uh, that is, that, that's, that's not from God. God's not the author of confusion. The devil's author of confusion and lack of information is the author of confusion. We get confused. How many of you have ever been confused before you got a GPS in your car trying to drive somewhere? All right. How many marriages have been saved since there's been a GPS in your car? I mean, hey. It's one of the great, greatest marriage tools that they ever, it's to save marriages with that GPS. Okay. You know where you're going? I sure do. It's right there on that map, right there. Okay. But he brings confusion within the churches by bringing disorder. And this is one of those areas. There's all types of varieties, and I'm going to get too into it today. But one of the things that I've learned is that the devil attacks what's most valuable. One of the things that God has given us in our lives today through the Holy Spirit is the ability to connect with the Holy Spirit and pray and the Holy Spirit to help us in prayer. Now, the Holy Spirit helps us in several ways in prayer, helps us to know what to pray. The Holy Spirit can guide us in our prayer. The Holy Spirit can help us to know what to pray for and what not to pray for. There have been times I'm praying, and I just felt on the inside, no, don't, don't pray that way. Pray this way. Shift the way you're praying. There are strongholds, bondages that we don't know exist in people's lives that we're just praying, oh, Lord, bless them. And the Holy Spirit wants us to be more specific, and he reveals things to us to pray. So it's very important to understand all the different dynamics of how the Holy Spirit helps us, and we'll unpack that more later in the power uh, uh, sermons on this particular topic. Now, God can direct us in every aspect of our lives, including guidance. And that's another way the Holy Spirit helps us. Romans 8, 12 through 14 says, Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. How are you glad about that? For if you live it by it, you, it dictates, in other words, what you feel your flesh wants to do, you're going to die. But if you live in the power of the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, and you will live. For you who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. I'll say that again. You who are led by God are the children of God. Everybody say led by the Spirit. What does that mean, led by the Spirit? Is some spirit walking around you? No, 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 no. Being led by the Spirit is simply this, that you are paying attention to and you allow uh, the Holy Spirit to lead you in your decisions rather than your own flesh and your own spirit. We, we are, Thessalonians is very clear, it tells us we are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body. We know what's happening to the body right now. The spirit and the soul are eternal. And so we're spiritual beings. Somebody says, well, I, I'm, I'm not very spiritual. Well, you're a spirit being. In other words, you're going to live somewhere forever. Somewhere forever. And there's only two places in the Bible. So you're going to live somewhere forever. And it's not Texas if you're a country western fan. Okay. I know, there's a, I know there's a country song that says, if I can't go to heaven, let me go to Texas. Well, sorry, that's not one of the choices. Okay. Now, we're spirit beings. So that's why being born again, that's why Jesus told Nicodemus in the garden when he said, how can I have eternal life? He said, well, you must be born again. And Nicodemus is like, you're crazy. I, I'm a grown man. I can't enter him back to my mother's womb. He said, look, Nicodemus, you've been born of the water. That's the natural. Now you need to be born of the spirit. That's where you get the term born again. I know the world makes fun of that terminology, but it's biblical and it's true to be born again. In other words, to come alive in Christ. In Adam's sin on the garden, Adam and Eve sin in the garden, we were separated from our spiritual relationship with God. Through Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection, we are connected once again with our Heavenly Father and we can be born again be spiritual beings in Him. Now, it's through that, through the Holy Spirit, that He can guide us in our lives. So walking in the Spirit simply means that we are responding to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, not our flesh. Have you ever wanted to say something to somebody that you shouldn't say? 
or do something you shouldn't do or slap somebody that really needed it, but you just, but something on the inside was like, no, warning, warning. Other than common sense, it could have been the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit wants to help us. Somebody says, well, if you think it, you just might as well say it. How dumb can you get? If we did that, nobody would be married. If we said everything that come to our mind, nobody would have any friends. Nobody would have a job. <laughs> if everything came to our mind, we just blurted it out. That's where the Holy Spirit says, no, let's not do that. The Holy Spirit there is to guide us and to help us in life. And, you know, and there's sometimes when maybe something needs to be said, but you're not the one to say it. Well they, need to, they need, well, they may need it, but you're not the one. They won't receive it from you. And you might mess up the whole plan of God if you insert yourself into the situation and mess up the timing of what God is doing, see? See, it's not just about whether it's the right thing. Well, the Lord gave me a word for them. Really? Are you sure? Maybe he just wants you to pray that word over them. See, that's, that's where being sensitive, the Holy Spirit comes in to give us guidance in life. In dealing with your children, in dealing with relationships, in dealing with work, everything. The Holy Spirit is not somebody we visit on Sunday. The Holy Spirit lives with us and walks with us. And as I shared with you the other day, every morning I get up, I, I usually go through this. I say, good morning, Father. Thank you for this day. This is a day you've made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for this day. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me, for raising from the dead, for taking my sins on you so that I could be saved. Thank you, Jesus, that I have eternal life through you with my heavenly Father. Thank you there's a home prepared for me. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Thank you that you're right here with me to help me through this day, to guide me and direct me and, and to help me and convict me where needed and all the different things in my life. Thank you, Holy Spirit. What are we going to do today, Holy Spirit? Let's get on with it now. That's how I start usually my day every day to having an awareness spiritually of my relationship with the Father, my forgiveness through Jesus, and my helper, Holy Spirit, that is here with me to help me throughout my day. Let's look at one more and wrap this up. The Holy Spirit, I love this one, helps us to become more like Jesus. Let me ask this question. Do you know anybody that needs to become more like Jesus? Don't point. Don't point at anybody. Do you know anybody? You thought I was going to ask you if you need to become more like Jesus. I am. But first of all, do you know somebody that needs to be more like Jesus? All right. Are you one of those somebodies? Is anybody here say, you know, if I could be a little bit more like Jesus, I would? Come on, wave at me if that's true, okay? Then how do we do that? Well, I'm just going to work at it. Well, that's good. But you and I can't work at it by ourselves and achieve that. We have to have the Holy Spirit's help. The Holy Spirit helps us. In Max Lucado's book entitled Just Like Jesus, here's the basic premise of his book. This is what it says. God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you the way you are. And he goes on to write, he wants you to be just like Jesus. You see, the good news is the Holy Spirit will help us to become like Jesus if we let him. I want to go to one more scripture and we'll wrap this up. Galatians 5, 16 through 17 and 22 through 23. I shared this in remix service the other night. I say then, walk in the Spirit. Say that with me. Walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh. They're contrary to one another so that you do not do the things you wish. So it's, it's talking about the flesh struggle, our outer flesh here, our, our will, our emotions and all that, and the Holy Spirit working in our lives. So again, what does walking in the Spirit mean? Does that mean you're just levitating an inch off the floor or whatever? No, it's nonsense. Walking in the Spirit is the same as being led by the Spirit. If you're walking in the Spirit, walking means the way you live, okay, our life. So you, you live your life responsive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, not the flesh on the outside of you, not your own will, not your own thoughts, not your own water. Well, I, 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 can't, I can't help it. Yes, you can. The helper is here to help you help it, see. The helper is here to help. If he can help me, he can help anybody. He can help any of us. But again, we've got to be honest with ourselves and willing for the Holy Spirit to move in our lives. 
it amazes me how many people have the acute ability to recognize deficiencies in other people's lives. Can I, deficiencies? You, do I have to unpack that? You know what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, deficiencies in other people's lives, but are totally oblivious to things in their own lives. Again, don't point at anybody, but do you know somebody like that? It amazes me. It's like they have an immunity to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. They can tell everybody else how to live, but they, they're immune themselves to the Holy Spirit convicting them. And what is conviction anyway? We talked about that last week. It's the Holy Spirit loving us, saying, I love you too much to leave you that way. I love you too much to not say, excuse me, that's wrong, what you're doing. The way you spoke to your wife, the way you spoke to your husband, the way you were, that, that's not right. That's not right. Because when we read, we get back to Galatians here. When we read verses 22 and 23, we find what's called the fruit of the Spirit. And it says, but when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, He will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How many of you think that would be good things to have in our life? See, that's the character of God. Not the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. A gift is something that's given, and the gifts of the Spirit is not a sign of maturity. Because a gift is just something that's given. One of the things that frustrates me is, and I, I, I have uh, somebody, I hire somebody, or we got a, some, I see somebody that they can just sit down at a piano and play anything. With their eyes shut, they can go to sleep and they can play anything. I mean, they're just gifted. They, it's a gift. They never took a piano lesson. When I was six years old, my mother started me on piano lessons. And for some reason, almost every one of my teachers was, excuse me, but an elderly lady that usually had this stick, a baton thing in her hand where she would peck it on the sheet music there and talk like this. <laughs> For eight years, took piano lessons. I had very few moments of enjoyment in eight years of taking piano. And then I see these guys that just sat down, they never had a piano lesson, oh, they just play everything. I was like, but I walk in the Spirit. I am led by the Spirit. <laughs> See, a gift, you didn't earn it. You didn't earn it. I've learned, though, real gifted people have a lack of appreciation, too. But that's another, that's another topic. But see, a fruit is something that's produced. Fruit has to be cultivated. It has to grow, you know. Uh, Rose and I, we, we wanted some, uh, some fruit trees. And so I, I go get some fruit trees and plant them. So I got four apple trees now and two pear trees and two peach trees. Hopefully sometime in our lifetime, they will bear fruit. Okay. <laughs> they're growing right now. I'm protecting them. They're, they're, they're growing. Okay. They got leaves on them. Look good. They look good. But, you know, it just, you just don't plant them and poof, there's fruit. It has to grow. It has to color. We have to watch. They have to grow. They have to mature. That the, the, they, they draw essentials out of the, the ground and it rain and, and, and we've got to watch over them and, and things like that. And then they produce blossoms and the little bees come by and they pollinate them and all that. I mean, it's such a process. It's the same is true in our lives. If we're going to be more like Jesus, it is a process. And we have to participate in the process. It's not like, oh, Jesus, I'm going to sleep now. Work on me while I'm asleep tonight. Because when I get up, i got stuff to do. I'm just telling you, Jesus, i got a full schedule all day tomorrow and all week long. So while I'm asleep, help me to be more like Jesus. Like it happens by osmosis. No, 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 no. It's our commitment to work with the Holy Spirit, to be sensitive to it. And that's where we have to be honest with ourselves. Because if the Holy Spirit loves us enough to not leave us the way we are, then he might put his finger on something in his life and we have to be willing to say, you know what? I am wrong. <sighs> For some people, they've never uttered that word. Again, don't point at anybody, not now. I am wrong. Holy Spirit, forgive me. Help me to be more like Jesus in this area. So we have to be honest with ourselves. But if we build up an immune system against the Holy Spirit... We can do anything we want. 
and say it's okay because we got a free pass from the Holy Spirit. God is not great on the curve. There are no free passes. What His Word says to one, it says to all. And so we just, if, if we do that, we're living in deception. We're not walking in the Spirit. And guess who the author of deception is? Satan. And how easily he can convince us that we're okay. We're okay. Now, the only solution to that is honesty before God and saying, Holy Spirit, help me to see what I don't see. Help me to be what I'm not being. Help me to do what I need to do. And that's one of the main things that Jesus said, it's better for you that I go away. Because if I don't go, the Father's not going to send the helper. But if I go, he's going to send the helper, and he's going to live with you. He's going to teach you. He's going to show you things. He's going to help you be more like me. Wow. It's amazing what God has made available to us. And if we're going to reach the world, if we're going to impact the world, the grace of God and the love of God, it's going to be, have to be more than just preaching. It has to be, and we're going to talk about this in a couple of weeks, the power of God working through the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you, we can't believe for the Holy Spirit to work in others if we won't allow him to work in us.